Welcome Yamhill County to Speaking Frankly. I'm your host Howie Harkema and our tagline is and how we do win. Today we're going to tackle a really tough subject. Um, Oregonians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty and a film called In the Execu Executioner's Shadow. And my guest today is Ron Steiner. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Howie. It's an honor to be here with you. Well, it's honored to have you here with us. Thank you. So how come so many people that are Oregonians don't know that we have a death penalty? Well, it's been a mystery to me. I've been here 10, 12 years, and a lot of people come up to me and say, do we still have a death penalty? And we do have a death penalty, but we don't use it very much. There's only been two executions in the last 53 years. They happened in 1996 and 1997. Both of them were volunteers. They didn't want to be in death row any longer, so they volunteered to be executed. So it's not prominent in the news. We're not talking about executions. There is a moratorium in place now. Started in uh, November of 2011, John Kitzhoffer, who was the governor at that time for yes. 96 and 97, he allowed them to happen and he had the opportunity to stop them, but he didn't and he regretted that greatly. So later on, he implored the uh, moratorium to stop any more executions. Well, as voters, don't we get to vote on that? We have to vote on it. It's the death penalty is ensconced in the uh, Oregon Constitution. Right. There are only three states in the United States who have that situation, ourselves in California and Florida. Every place else where states have the death penalty, it can be changed in their legislature. I was involved in New Mexico when I lived in Albuquerque and with the uh, uh, New Mexico Coalition to Repeal the Death Penalty. And in 2008, it was appealed, 2009, it was repealed in the legislature there. Mm -hmm. Wow. So would you talk about Gary Haugen for a moment? Well, I mentioned John Kitzhoffer stopping the execution right. in, 19, in 2011. Uh, there was a death warrant for Gary Haugen, who was a longtime criminal. Had uh, long, I should say, I like to talk it more in humanity terms. A longtime inmate, okay, who did some terrible things and was in general population, and then was involved in a murder in the prison, and he then was resentenced to death. And Gary Hoggins was coming up, to, he was going to be, his death sentence was going to be execution on, in January of the next year. And John Kitzhoffer, who had done it before, allowed it to happen, said, not in my watch anymore. He regretted that he did that. He didn't want to do it again. He didn't want it on his conscience. So he declared the moratorium at that point. Uh, governor Kate Brown, when she became the governor, she continued the moratorium. So it's still in place, and it keeps uh, it, the dis discussion limited at this point. Well, if that's very interesting because I don't, I don't think most Oregonians know that it's still out there. It is still out there, and they should know because we're spending a lot of money to keep it. Our audits of the people that spent money on keeping the death penalty through all the appeals processes. We are spending as taxpayers over $29 million every year to keep the death penalty in place and we don't use it. It's ridiculous. It's a failed public policy to do that. Well, it seems a shame that we're spending all that money to keep it when it could be utilized, the, that money could be utilized in so many better ways. Yes. That's sort of why <coughs> our title of our organization is all Oregonians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. And for all that spending, we think there are alternative uses for the men. Our state is strapped in terms of health care costs, in ter terms of education costs and investments. We are so strapped in so many areas, but we spend $29 million to keep something that doesn't work or doesn't be used right. on the death penalty. So if we were to take some of that money and do uh, addiction programs for, the, for those who yes. are addiction. The state has a, an addiction program that really works. It's in one of the prisons in central, New Mexico, or central Oregon. It has an 88% success rate for anybody that goes through the nine-month program. They do not reoffend. They no, do not continue their addiction. 
The problem is it can only deal with about 70 people at a time. I see. We've got over 14,400 people in the prisons here. Right. And a large, large percent of them have addictions. More money for better mental health care. Yes. Mental, people who have mental disabilities. More money for the police departments to do a better job in terms of their forensic and their inv in investigation into cold cases, sure. things of that nature. Give the district attorneys more money because they have a, a, a victim's advocate wing on their, in their office that does really good work. So there's lots of alternative ways to be spending that money that we're not. And it would also re lower the recidivism rate um, being through that uh, channel of nine months, uh, clean and sober, and then coming back into society. Absolutely. Most of the people that are in prison eventually are going to get out. There's a small percentage that have life without parole as their sentence, but most of them are coming out. And we want them to come out as better citizens, right. better able to continue to, to do a good job in whatever they're doing, from being a father to a brother to, to a, a, an employee. Exactly. So uh, all of these things help the state in, in very many ways. Well, we'll talk about how people can help in a little while here. Um, would you tell us about the 1914 appeal and some of the history and background of all of this? Well, Oregon has a, a sort of a fickled past with the death penalty. We've had it and had it and had it taken away. We've had it and taken away all by votes of the people. So way back, way back in 1894, 96, 98, women were trying to get the right to vote. Right. Women do not have the vote at the ballot at that time. So people in McMinnville should know a little bit about this. Uh, they have a, a middle school in this town that is named after one of the suffragettes, Abigail Scott Dunaway. Right. She was one of the real activists in this whole thing. So the men kept saying, no, we don't want the women to work, to get the vote. So the women kept pursuing and pursuing, and the men would say, well, if they get the vote, they'll probably want to get rid of the death penalty mm -hmm. as one of the first things they do. Well, eventually in, in 18, or 1912, they got the vote. They won the vote by a vote of the people. And by 1914, the, the death penalty was repealed. Sure. Four years later, it was brought back by a vote of the people because people were concerned about violence and fearful about the way that criminals were sure. do, doing things. So it's, it's changed back and forth. If I can take a couple more minutes. You can. The next time that it happened <coughs> was in 1964, and you're old enough to remember how we, oh, what oh, it yeah. was like oh, in 64. Yeah. I do. There was a protest against the war in Vietnam. Uh, the, the civil rights activities were going on. People were progressively moving to the left in terms of their philosophy. And so getting rid of the death penalty was a prominent thing. Well, 20 years later, by 1984, R Ronald Reagan, who was our president, his mantra, you'll probably remember, was tough on crime. Right. Let's be tough on crime. And so being having a death penalty... The pendulum was swinging back to conservative ways, and they wanted to be tough on crime. So they said, this is the symbol of being tough. If we can kill our citizens, this is a wonderful badge to wear that we're tough on crime. So it's back in. So do you think some of that stems from his acting career in the Yippie Kaye? <laughs> <laughs> he was taking that saddleback stuff for, for serious. For real, yeah. So 30 states are currently have the death penalty on their books. They do, on their books. That's a good way to say it, because not everybody's using it. That's right. There's probably half of those states that haven't had a, a, an execution in five years, and the biggest part of that half haven't had one in 10 years. There's lots of issues with why people are not. The mood is changing. Prosecutors, in some cases, are changing the way they pursue death, getting the, the uh, lethal injection drugs has been a big problem. Sure. Most of the drugs that were used, the three, three uh, drug cocktail that used to be used for executions, were coming from Europe. 
And the European Union does not have death penalty anywhere, and they forbid it everywhere. And so the, the chemical companies over there, the pharmaceutical companies over there, will no longer ship their chemicals if they're going to be used in executions Good for in the United States. A bold thing to do. Very bold. So the very aggressive states, some of them, most of them in the South, have said, well, we'll find other ways. We'll go to uh, compounding pharmacies. These are people who have a laboratory and they make chemicals themselves. Sure. Some of them might have them in their basement. So these chemicals are getting out into the hands of the departments of corrections without any testing, without knowing how lethal mm -hmm. they are or how dangerous they might be. So there's lots of things that are keeping states from uh, using executions now. So which state has the most executions of the, in the United States? Well, the, the, the gold seal is in Texas. Okay. Most, most of that is coming from, again, the Wild West mentality. And it's changing. Fortunately, it is yes. changing. Uh, not that many years ago, maybe six, eight, ten years ago, Harris County, which is Houston, mm -hmm. was the number one county in the country for uh, death sentences and executions. And they've changed. They've changed the prosecutors. They've changed their attitude. And that's no longer the case in Texas. Texas is, is doing fewer executions now than some of the other case, uh, states that are doing them. Well, that's interesting. In 2015, 2016, 2017, the numbers kept falling down and down and down. In 19 or 2000, no, 1998, there were 103 executions oh. in the country, and we're now down in the 20s, where across the country there's only 25 or 26. This year there might be 26. There's a couple more scheduled in the United States yet here in this month, but uh, it's they're liable to be contested and not take place. Like John Kitzhaber, do you find that some of the governors now want to pardon some of these people so they aren't ex executed? Yes, they do. In fact, uh, in uh, the New York Times, I don't want to date this program, but in the New York Times in December, there was an opinion piece that was authored about asking Governor Jerry Brown in California to commute their row. Their row is 760 women and men who are on death row there. Oh, you're kidding. So there, and this was signed by about seven or eight governors who are in favor of doing this. And John Kitzhoffer was one of the signatories. Sure. So he's very instrumental in all this. The present governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf, is on there. Two former New Mexico governors where I worked Tony Anaya and, and Bill Richardson are both on that list. Uh, gov former Governor Malloy, if I remember, was another one, and, Tom and Quinn from Illinois. They all signed this community. So there's lots of politicians who are very much, and they, they've been in that situation where they had the ability to stop the killing of a citizen, and they didn't. And then they got a chance to get redemption, and they, they will not do that anymore. Good. Um, which regional area of the U.S. has the most executions? In the South. Yeah. Mostly in the South. And some of that is vestigial to slavery. Sure. Uh, there is a, a major, major bias, <coughs> excuse me, in the Death Penalty Administration based on race and place. The ex the uh, the state you're in or the county you're in makes a difference. The color of your skin makes a difference. Yes. Um, this whole thing that I started with to get involved and learn about the death penalty stemmed from a, a question that Sister Helen Prejean mentioned in a speech she was making in Albuquerque. She said, what percentage of people who are tried and convicted of capital murder get a death sentence? It was a rhetorical question, 450 people in the audience. It was a rhetorical question, so she answered it. At the time, it was less than 2%, and she continued very quickly. They are all poor, and a large percentage of them are people of color. A disproportionate percentage are people of color. So race makes a big difference in the case and where you are. In the South, 
uh, has that reputation sure. of bias in terms of racial bias, then it falls over. Uh, there's also some things in the Bible. The southern people who read the Bible and they read an eye for an eye, which means revenge to them, say God ordains this to give us the ability to kill somebody who killed somebody else. But that doesn't make any sense, to kill somebody who killed somebody. What's the reason people support the death penalty? Well, there's lots of reasons. Uh, number one, fairness. Well, number one is there are alternatives. We don't need to be doing this. Right. Uh, we have life without the possibility of parole as an alternate sanction. And these are people who are judged that they're violent enough or whatever their problems were, that they're not going to get out. Ever. Ever. Those, that's one of the alternatives. The alternatives that we mentioned earlier about using this money for different things are there. So that's one of the things. Uh, from a moral or a spiritual way point of view, a lot of people are against the death penalty because they don't believe in, in killing people. Sure. If you're Buddhist, that's part of the Buddhist thought that we don't kill anything, anything. Let, alone, let alone people. Insects, right. anything, right. If there's lots of religions that feel that way, so that's another one. Uh, the fact that it's uh, not a remedy for victim family members. The people who are in favor of the death penalty, many say, well, the victim families need this for closure. Well, we know a lot of people, and I used to serve on a board, National Board of Directors for Murder Victim Families for Reconciliation, and at least half of the people who have had that terrible thing happen to them, and you can understand why they'd be angry, but about half of them for sure are not in favor of a death sentence because it does not honor their loved one, sure. does not bring their loved one back, does not help this mentality of we need to be tough on crime to have anything. And closure is a myth. It's a myth. We have a booklet through our organization, Oregonians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty, with 11 stories of murder victim family members from Oregon. There's a lot more, and we like to know about them because we like to support them in term, various terms, ways. And these people all tell the story that it happened to them. It was harrowing. Their first uh, reactions might have been revenge, but they thought about it a little bit and find that it is not good to do that, and they do not find closure when it happens. So what can we do to, oppo to oppose this cruelty? To oppose... The, the cruelty involved in the death penalty. Well, we, we can work on <clears throat> different ways to change it because it is a part of the Constitution and we need a vote of the people. We go back to your first question, why do not more people know about it? It's an education process. Our organization's mission is to repeal the death penalty. Right. Our task is to educate people, educate people to the facts about the reasons why we should not have a death penalty. It's a failed public policy. It's a waste of money. It does not deter crime. There's lots of evidence that it does not right. deter crime, which is one of the things that the people in favor keep saying. I had a uh, legislator just the other day say he was in favor of the death penalty because he thinks it's a deterrent. He's a former police officer and thinks it's a deterrent. Yeah. There is no pure empirical evidence that proves that it's a deterrent at all. Let's talk about the film In the Executioner's Shadow. Um, Caroline, if you would bring up that graphic. There it is. So, Executioner's Shadow is a film <coughs> made by uh, two people who are at American University. Uh, Maggie Stogger, who is a uh, professor of communications, and another professor, Rick Stack, who came to Oregon on a speaking tour with us four years ago, and he wrote the book, uh, Grave Injustice. It's about 16 uh, stories of people who were executed wrongly. They were proven to be innocent sure. after their death, too late to do anything. And so I, I have this 
personal relationship with Rick, and so he and Maggie put this film together. And it's a wonderful film because it does a couple of things to provoke the conversation, and sure. that's what we're interested in. It goes through story, three different stories, an executioner, uh, some people who were uh, injured badly in the Boston Marathon bombing, and a couple that lost their daughter to, to uh, murder. And it goes through all of the anxieties they've had, all the feelings they've had, all the thoughts that they've had, and it doesn't answer the questions. Sure. It makes the audience think about it so they will answer the questions. Caroline, can you bring that back down? Thank you. Um, so when is the premiere? Because I know it's occurring here soon. Well, there's been a premiere in California first, but the, uh, the Oregon premiere in our organization has the rights to use this. We paid the rights to use this for four months during the legislative session to promote the conversation. Sure. Uh, the first one will be the 15th of January in Salem as a part of the progressive uh, film series that they have down there every month. McMinnville is going to have one soon after that, the 1st of February. It's a Friday night uh, done by the Meaningful Movie Night people right. here in, in McMinnville. And they will have it and in addition to the film, which takes a 54-minute film, there's going to be discussion following. That's always good. The discussion in Salem will be conducted with the audience with three speakers. John Kitzhoffer who declared the moratorium, Paul de Munez, who's a former Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court, and Frank Thompson, who was the superintendent of the prison and had to oversee the two executions that I mentioned in 96 yes. and 97. Yes, right. And Frank went into this job thinking he was in favor of the death penalty, but when he had to do it himself, he started to have second thoughts. And he understands the terrible trauma that anybody who has to do with that, not just the executioner himself or herself, right. but anybody who has anything to do with that, and there's a, a staff of probably 30 or 40 people who are involved, they gotta go home. And when their kids say, well, how was your day today, daddy? It, Can it, you imagine? It's trauma. You bet. And so the film is gonna be playing in McMinnville at the Cooperative Ministries in the Great Room. And the time is 6.30. 6.30, yeah. yeah. So and we'll have a discussion afterward. We will have some of that filmed, uh, the discussion in Salem filmed and be available. But we want to have more time for the people in the audience to have a discussion about it. Oh, they're it. definitely going to have some questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, additionally, where can people go on the website or other places to get more information on this topic for Oregon? Well, we have an, a website, Yes. www.oadp.org is our website, and it uh, has a lot of our information about what's going on in, in uh, Oregon. It has our newsletters that you can scroll through and see old newsletters, see the current newsletters. It has information about some of the activities that we're doing and alerts to things that we want people to know about. Nationally, there's a website, it's called www.deathpenaltyinfo.org. No, death okay. This is in Washington, D.C. It's an independent organization that keeps all the statistics, all the stories, all the news about the death penalty nationally. And they have a historical library of lots of different things. An archive. An yeah. archive, and they also have daily stories of what's news, what's new news in terms of the death penalty across the country. So that's a very valuable one. Most states have their own, so if you wanted to say what's going on in Pennsylvania, just Google Pennsylvania Death Penalty Organization. Uh, <coughs> California has a wonderful website. It's called deathpenaltyfocus.org. Uh, so there's lots of places to get information. So through the OADP, can they link over to some of these other websites? Sure, sure. We, we do that on occasion as well. And we, we will probably eventually uh, have a link that people can see this film in their home. But we'd rather they don't until they get a chance to have a discussion with other people about the topic 
which is what we're intending to do. So do you plan on being at the Cooperative Ministries I for that discussion? There. I will be there. I'm hoping that Frank Thompson will be there with me. Yes. And we're going to, Howie, we're going to take this around the state. I've been talking to people in about 20 different towns and cities. Get on I-5, go on south. Albany, Corvallis, which we just hooked up today. Eugene, Roseburg, Medford, Ashland. We're going to have a chance to talk to people in those places as well. So if Yamhill County people have relatives and friends down there, tell them it's coming. Sure. And eventually you'd like to have it also play on MCM. Sure, we would. Yeah. Uh, we're going to offer it to, to the cable companies here right. to run it successively 10 or 12 times after we do the, the live right. showing with the audience here. So after, in sometime in February, it would be available. I don't know what the schedule will be. Yeah, of course. Um, <coughs> so we'll, we'll get you all set up with that, uh, that information as well. Um, so Ron, what has drawn you to do this really, really important work? Um, if somebody would have asked me in the late 1990s, do you believe in the death penalty, do you think it's a good idea? I would have probably said, yeah, it's a good idea. They did something terrible, so we should do something about it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about it. I didn't think much about it at all until I heard Sister Helen talk. But previous to that, my children got me involved in this. Not in this one particularly, but my children, Amy and her brother Michael, were in high school and they were doing community service work. And it was really good work, fascinating work. And I was out working all the time. So they finally start saying, Dad, why don't you do something worthwhile in your community? So I got into community service, Habitat for Humanity, a children's charity, a, a film festival for the, uh, the Children's Hospital, and then a, 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 a halfway house for former felons. Mm. And I thought when I started to get down there, I was going to be a cook and stay for dinner with them. I said, these guys are not like me. They're all inmates, former inmates. They're all criminals. And I got down there, and they were all like me. They were very much <laughs> like me. They made mistakes or had bad backgrounds or sure. things like that. But my children get some credit for getting me into this area. But I believe in it for many reasons. It's hard work for me. It's, it's a bad public policy for the, for the state and the country to be doing this. And I don't believe in killing people, anybody. I don't kill them. people believe in killing people. So those are some of the reasons that I have. I have there's a whole litany of things to be reasoned for. I'm sure there's much more to it than that, just yeah, that. Yeah. But just the expenditure alone seems like it's insane. Yeah, it is insane. The alternatives are available and they work. There's lots of states in Washington, our, our neighbors in Washington yes. were the first. Their, their Supreme Court just last month declared it un, unconstitutional. They haven't had an execution up there for many years, but they declared it unconstitutional, so that became the, the 20th state without a death penalty. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Ron, for being on. And um, I, I'm going to quickly talk to the audience and Go to the Cooperative Ministries on the 1st of uh, February at 6.30, and um, you'll get to see this film um, called In the Executioner's Shadow, and then a discussionary top uh, uh, time afterward, and um, bring your questions. And Ron, it's been great to have you with us. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much for being on today. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. And you did smile. <laughs> I so, do smile on occasion. Yeah, that's always good. It's a hard subject, so yeah. it's hard to smile about it. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching today.